And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. There, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own work, works as God did from his. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us... There, let's all let's read this last verse together. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may find mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. How appropriate that, that uh, song we sang this morning, Tell It to Jesus. Yeah? Well, we'll, we'll get to that later on. 
Let's go ahead and have a seat, please. Uh, Brother Alex, could you open us in a word of prayer? Amen. So there was an evangelist that was preaching at a church on Sunday morning. And after the services, a couple at the church invited him and his wife to join them in the afternoon for dinner. During the dinner, they had mashed potatoes, string green beans, pie, and roast ham. The evangelist's wife was curious about the ham. She wondered why both ends were sliced off. So she pulled aside the missus and asked. I don't know, was her response, but we always have done it that way. Later that evening, the missus was on the phone with her mom, and she was recalling the events that transpired during that afternoon with the evangelist and his wife. So she asked, by the way, mom, why do we cut off the ends of the ham before we roast it? You guys know the roast ham, you know what I'm talking about? It's like a loaf of ham. Okay. Why do we cut off both of the ends before we roast it? Her mom, I don't know, dear. Your grandma always did it that way. So the next Thursday, while the mother and daughter were visiting the grandma at the nursing home, during the conversation it came up. Mother dearest, we were talking about your famous roast hams this week, and they are as delicious as always. But I was wondering, why did you always cut off both ends of the ham before putting it in the oven? Grandma, as sharp as ever, responded, well, my child, that started during the Depression. Your grandfather brought home a pan to roast the hams in on his meager salary. But because he, brought the, he bought the smallest pan from the store, it was always just a little too short to fit the entire ham in. So I sliced off the ends so it could fit all right in the pan. The daughter and mother looked at each other, and without giving up any more information, they said their goodbyes and left. Sometimes we, uh, we tend to do what we've been taught without really giving it much thought, without really thinking about what Give it any second thought, and I think for one, one thing, for Baptists, e even Baptists, independent Baptists, we, tend, we can do that, that same thing too. Um, but it's important, well, especially for independent Baptists, that we, when we examine the scriptures, when we discern God's word, we always give it thought. We always compare scriptures with the scriptures. We always compare our traditional beliefs by comparing scriptures with scriptures. Let the word be the final, final authority. So last week, uh, we had talked about Hebrews chapter 2. Before that, we talked, sorry, not last week, but the, a couple weeks ago. And before that, we uh, talked about, in chapter 1, we talked about how Christ is better than the angels. We talked about how Christ has, Jesus Christ has an eternal inheritance that he wants to share with us. That that's tends to be the theme here in Hebrews. Christ was the only man who was worthy to inherit all things from the Father. He became worthy as a man to inherit everything he already had as God. But that was the only way that he could share that with us. And so we have an opportunity that's, that's even better than what Adam and Eve had in the garden before the fall. You see, while the, the garden was a wonderful place, they did not have the opportunity to inherit all things from God in the garden. So God had a better plan. So let's go ahead and start uh, verse 1 through 6. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, that word partakers there, it's the word uh, metokos, which it means 
that 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 Hebrew, uh, that uh, Greek word it means partners or associates. Okay, it's kind of the sense that you get when we're talking about like a business, and when you've got people who are on on equal footing, who share that business together. In fact, there was a passage in Luke 5, 7 that uses the same word. Just so you get an idea of what, what this word partakers means. It says, and they beckoned unto their partners. That word partners there is the, the same word. Which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. And this was during one of the miracles where Jesus told them, You cast the net on this side, and you'll get a lot of fish. And so, wh what a great picture of, you know, that we are partakers with Christ in this work here in the earth. Partakers of Christ, we are. We are sanctified, that word sanctified, meaning, and in chapter 2 it talked about, meaning that we are set apart for a purpose. Okay, we are set apart for a purpose. And we are partakers of this heavenly calling. That heavenly calling is, of course, the, the New Testament church. Okay, it's our, our meeting together here, it's our evangelizing and reaching the lost. It's um, what Jesus Christ had instructed us to do after he left. He says, consider, consider our heavenly calling. I'm sorry, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That word consider there is katanaeo, and it means to behold or fully observe. So consider, let's think about Christ Jesus and how he was faithful to him that appointed him. Who appointed Christ Jesus? Who appointed him? The Father, yeah. The Father appointed Christ Jesus. The same as Moses was faithful in all of his house. Now let's think about that. Moses, who was his legal house? Who was Moses? What, what was Moses' legal house that he was raised up in? Legally, he would say that was, you know, where he came from. Who was that? I'm sorry? Pharaoh, yes. So he was raised in the house of Pharaoh, but he forsook the house of Pharaoh in order to identify with Israel, in order to identify with his true genealogy, with Israel. And actually, let's, let's have a look at uh, Hebrews eleven twenty four through 29. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward." By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians essayed to do were drowned. Okay, so we see here that Moses, he was part of the house of Pharaoh, but he forsook that. Okay, and, and Jesus Christ likewise was born as a man in the flesh, but he forsook that for a heavenly calling. So he wants us to behold, behold Jesus Christ and how he, 
he forsook sin, he forsook pursuing after the, the flesh and lust of this life, and instead chose to follow the Father, just like Moses did with the house of Pharaoh and followed after uh, God and followed after Jesus Christ, seeing the invisible. So, the Hebrews, they admired Moses. They looked up to Moses. Moses did a lot of things for them. He led them out of Egypt. Moses gave them the Passover, as it said. Okay, the Passover feast, the keep of every year. Moses was the one who brought that to them. Moses also brought them through the Red Sea, parted the Red Sea. Moses also gave them the law. Moses gave them the manna from heaven, instructed them on how to gather it, instructed them on, uh, also on keeping the Sabbath. So they really looked up to Moses. So now we see the writer here is comparing Jesus Christ to Moses. And, and what he's going to say here is that Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Moses, amen? amen. For he says here, uh, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man. But he that built all things is God. Obviously, Jesus Christ is God. He just got done saying that. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant and a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope of firm unto the end. So if we want to be part of his house after we're saved, then we need to hold fast to the confidence and rejoicing unto the end. He's speaking to believers here, okay? Because we, he's going to get into some warnings here. We run the risk. We run the risk of missing out on certain opportunities and certain promises in the new covenant. If we do not walk by faith and follow with, uh, within the steps that Christ has left for us. Let's go on to, to verse 7. Now, it's a, this is a very interesting set of verses. And I'm going to say um, we're going to... Because the, the, the sentence starts, wherefore... And then he's got parentheses that go on for about three verses. So I'm going to cover the parentheses first. And then we're going to come back and we're going to cover the whole sentence so we don't get lost in, in everything in the parentheses. So we get the concept that he's trying to say, and then we come back and we get the bigger picture. Okay? So we're going to start with just what's in the parentheses, and then we'll come back and uh, review what's outside of the parentheses. As the Holy Ghost said today, if ye will hear his voice... Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest." Now that word rest there, it's the word, uh, the he Greek word is katapausis, sorry, katapausis. And this word comes from the, the Greek word katapao, which means to colonize, means to settle down. It means to call a place as home. Remember the Hebrews, the, the Israelites, they were going through the wilderness and they were promised a land that would be theirs, Canaan, okay, that they could settle down and call home. So we want to keep that in mind here that 
when he's saying, you cannot enter into my rest. He's talking about Canaan. He's talking about a certain generation was not able to go and settle there. They stayed in the wilderness and they died in the wilderness. Okay? In fact, Moses. Did Moses enter Canaan? No. Why not? I'm sorry? Disobedience. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at that. So yeah, Moses was denied entry because he disobeyed God. When, he, when God told him to strike the rock in Horeb for water, and then the second time he told him to speak to the rock, but he hit the rock both times. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. First, we're going to look at Exodus 17, 6. Turn to Exodus 17, 6. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now let's go to Numbers chapter 20, verse 7 through 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron and thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So we have no doubt that Moses is saved. We have no doubt that Moses is a believer. But he was denied entry. Even Moses, someone these Hebrews looked up to, was denied entry into Canaan. And we're getting some warnings here. We're getting some warnings here. Not about, this is not about eternal life. He's not brought up anything about eternal life. He's talking to believers, okay? He's not saying you're going to lose your eternal life. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying you're going to miss out on some great opportunities that Jesus Christ is giving in the new covenant. So, he says, enter into my rest. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. They shall not go into Canaan. So now let's go ahead and read, starting with the wherefore in verse 7, and then we're going to continue in verse 12, okay? Because that whole parenthesis is actually just in there. It's just a comma. It's just a bringing that back up to their remembrance, Okay? Wherefore, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And the, key, the word there, brethren, we, need, we know he's talking to believers. We know this is an admonition to believers. Okay. Now, some people, when they go through these passages, Hebrews 3 and 4, they're only thinking in terms of salvation. They've only got salvation on mind. And when you try to force that interpretation without actually reading the chapters like we've done, you're going to end up with some really wacky doctrine. You're going to end up with some doctrine that, that seems to be saying we can lose our salvation. And that's not what it's saying. What 
the author of Hebrews is telling us here is that we could miss out. It's an admonition that we could miss out on certain opportunities, certain blessings, certain things that Jesus Christ would have for us. So let's take a look at, let's go to John chapter 14, 1 through 4. Jesus Christ is speaking here. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Okay, so Jesus, when he ascended again to heaven, he left to go prepare a place. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute, okay, God who, the same God who spoke everything we can see. Have you ever gone outside at nighttime and just admired the stars? Sometimes I get these pictures through, uh, like, the Hubble telescope, and it's just mind-blowing seeing just the, the massive amount of detail and beauty there is that, that's just beyond our, even, even beyond our view, okay, out there. And God has created all of that. Within seven days, he just spoke all of these things. Within one day, he spoke all the heavens into existence. So could you imagine a place where God spends several thousands of years preparing it could you imagine what that might be like? I mean, we, we uh, let's see, I've got a, a phone here, right? And we, mankind has developed this phone. And if we, if we took this and sent it back, let's say, 10 years from now, okay? Someone looks at it and they're like, wow, what is this? I mean, it's just fascinating, right? You know, I mean, if you if just think back just 10 years ago. If you were looking at an iPhone, or uh, sorry, iPhones came out, okay, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, time flies. 20 years ago, you're looking at an iPhone, okay? And when they first came out, people were just absolutely fascinated by them, right? Like, how in the world, okay? Now, that's, that's man's ingenuity, okay? And man has, you know, produced some very interesting things because God has given us a creative mind. He's given us intelligence. But could you imagine God creating an entire city an entire city and spending 2,000 plus years doing it. What that place must be like. It's got to be just absolutely mind-blowing when we see it. In fact, we, we have uh, John trying to give us just a little bit of an understanding of what he saw. And I mean, the words... The words just do not, cannot speak to what all he saw. Let's go to Revelations chapter 3, 11 through 13. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's a pretty fantastic promise. I mean, one that, you know, we want to, uh, we want to live our lives in a way that we, we can be part of that, I would hope. Revelations chapter 21. Let's go to Revelations chapter 21. And I'm not going to get through the, the reading. You can read the whole city about the whole city, it goes through and talks here, and he measures it. And in in Revelations, we're not we don't have enough time for that. 
But he says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay. And, and we know that, you know, if we go through and we read here, uh, we know that the city is given to, is uh, for Jesus Christ and his bride to dwell. Okay? For Jesus Christ and his bride to dwell. We know that the bride is the church, and not in some universal sense. That's not in some universal sense. We hear the local church in Seam Reap, okay? That is a congregation serving Jesus Christ. But there is a coming a day when those of us who are here will have our membership transferred to a heavenly membership. When we go to sleep, our membership will be transferred to a heavenly membership. And when all of us are there, there will just be one body. There will be one congregation, one church, one assembly, right? Because we'll all be congregated together. And on that day, for eternity, we'll be congregated with all the saints and with Christ Jesus himself. And on that day, it will be one church, but it will still be local. It will still be local. There's some out there that teach that, well, once you get saved, you're instantly part of the church. Yet the scriptures the, the word ecclesia, it has the meaning of local gathering, assembly, congregating together, okay? And, you know, John the Baptist gave baptism. Jesus Christ furthered that, that, you know, we, to become part of a church, we need to be baptized, right? After we believe, after we believe, we need to be baptized. So to be a member of a church, we have to be a believer, and we have to be baptized, Right? So here we continue uh, getting this word of caution, though, from ab about not entering into his rest. The possibility, that rest being, I believe, the eternal ever after. And we'll see that here. I mean, he really kind of makes that clear in a moment here. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So there's a corporate responsibility. There's a responsibility we have one to each other, to hold each other accountable, to admonish each other in love, to, to encourage each other, and to pray for each other, is what he's saying here. For lest any of you be hardened, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, as believers, we can still pursue after the flesh. We can still uh, sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So verse 16 is an interesting one. What he says there, that even though there were all these that came out of Egypt with Moses, okay, it wasn't everyone. It wasn't everyone that was rebellious and stubborn and provoking God. But the, the ones that weren't, they weren't holding the others accountable. They weren't, they weren't um, calling out the sin that was there. Only Moses was, okay, Moses and Aaron. So because they weren't holding each other accountable, yet they all, all of that generation did not go into the land of Canaan. So we have a corporate responsibility to hold each other accountable in the church, is what I gather from this. And it, it also, first, if we go to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 6. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. 
Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things per that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I'm um, sorry, I, that wasn't... Okay, sorry, go to chapter 5. I mean, go to chapter 5. Let's uh, have a look at verse 3. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in, in, my, in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And he, going on down here, um, okay, that's okay. I I can look for that another time. We'll bring that up ne next time. There's a verse I was looking for in there, but I'm not seeing it right now, so we'll just uh, move on because we've just got a couple minutes left. Okay, so we're moving on uh, to this word of caution in Hebrews. Let's, let's go on to chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, them being the, the Israelites, the Hebrews, okay? For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So there is, when, when we believe, there's, he actually talks about two kinds of rest here. When we first put our faith and trust in Christ, when we believe and put our faith and trust in Christ, we are entering into his rest. But he goes on and says this. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So he says that um, when God created the earth, on the seventh day God rest, giving them uh, the, the Sabbath, right, for the, the Israelites. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore... It remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day okay so there was the rest that was given for the sabbath that was given to the israelites and where there's also you know when we put our faith and trust in christ we can following in in christ's footsteps it is a, effectively like a rest it is a, a rest because we're putting away um we're getting a rest from sin and away from you know the things of the world but he says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. 
there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now what's interesting there is verse 9. For the first time, the, the word for rest in the, the Greek actually changes. It's a different word that's used there. And the word that's used there is sabatismos. I'm sorry, I put the wrong emphasis. Sabatismos. It's where we get the word Sabbath from, okay? In the essence of that, you know, there's a, an end to our labor, an end to our work, okay? He says, uh, continuing on here, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own work as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So again, that encouragement there to us is to stay within the, the new covenant he has given us, to, to walk after Christ's footsteps, to, to do the work that he has set out for us, that someday we may also enter into that, that place of rest, that, that place that we can live with him, an abode, to forever be with Christ Jesus, okay, in his presence, always. Again, he's not talking about eternal life here. That's not what he's talking about. He's not saying, you know, you're going to lose your eternal life if you don't do this. He's, he never mentioned that. What he's talking about is a certain promise that was not available to Adam and Eve before the fall, a promise of a city, of a place, where we can dwell with our Lord and Savior forever, for all eternity. Continuing on here. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, many of you have that verse memorized. And we often use that when we're talking about the, the scriptures, right? Can I give you something, though? Uh, nothing wrong with using it in regards to scriptures, but can I give you something? The word there, for the word of God, that's the word logos. In the, the Greek, it's the word logos. And we're given this exact same phrase, this exact same wording. In, uh, let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word. That's the Logos. Okay? The same. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now let's, let's read this again with the understanding that this may be speaking not just of, I mean, obviously the word of God is from Jesus Christ, and it is, it is a, a very powerful word. I mean, the gospel is a very powerful word. But what gives it that power is Jesus Christ. It is all about him. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it only tells us about Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, prophesying and giving us all of these, these uh, examples to point to his coming. In the New Testament, we have his life here on earth. We, it is all about Jesus Christ. So if we read that, and we read that as, just for a moment here, for the word of God is, uh, 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 I'll prove it to you that, that that's actually talking about Jesus Christ. Because in verse 13, it says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in its sight. No, in his sight. Jesus Christ is a discerner of the soul. 
a discerner of the Spirit. He can see everything. He is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we just got finished getting this warning, these words of caution about how we could miss out on this, this great opportunity, and about how Jesus can see everything into our hearts. But then we have the last two verses here. So we have, neither is any, there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That being Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can see everything. Seen then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. How are we going to do that? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So how can we how can we pursue after this promise and how can we not fall short of it? By going boldly before the throne of grace, finding help in the time of need. We have we have a partner. We are partakers. Jesus Christ he wants to help us through this life, to, to keep us away from following after the flesh, to walk in the Spirit. And the way we can do that, the way we can do that is by boldly approaching the throne of grace, getting on our knees, praying before the Lord. Amen? Okay. That's, oh, you know what? I just, I, I have a few more things, actually. Let's go back to verse, I've got two minutes, so <laughs> we'll, we'll use up these two minutes. I've got um, in verse 12 through 14. I want to just go through some of these words here. For the word of God that is the logos of God, okay, Jesus Christ, is quick, quick meaning alive, powerful, which is the word energes, means active and, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. So, Jesus Christ, he is alive today, and he is active within our own congregation. He is active here with us, okay, the whole, through the Holy Spirit. He is, if, you, if uh, you're saved, Jesus Christ dwells in you, and so he is active here with us. He is alive, and he is powerful he can accomplish. He can give us the ability to accomplish what we need. He can give us everything that we need as we need it. Okay, now I, I spoke earlier about Moses and about how he hit the rock in, uh, two times. And I, I want you to just take note of that because it's going to become important when we get to chapter 6. When we get through chapter 6, we're going to see how that's very much, uh, it's a perfect picture of what's being talked about in chapter 6, okay? Because what, what uh, Moses did by, um, by hitting the rock the first time, that the rock, it represents what? What does that rock represent? Jesus Christ, amen. And be, when he hit the rock the first time, it represents the death of Christ on the cross, Amen? The, the death of Christ on the cross for our sins. And Jesus Christ only needs to die once for our sins, right? But when we get into chapter 6, we're, we're going to see in a way how we could be treating the rock in the same way that Moses did. That we could be treating Christ in the same way that Moses did. As the Hebrews here were thinking about walking away from the new covenant, okay, and how that can be the equivalent of 
hitting the rock twice? How it could be the equivalent of crucifying Christ afresh, uh, afresh is what it says. So we'll, we'll get into that, but that's just a preview for next time. Okay.